I know we were, we had, we, we had just a little bit of algebra left, is that it? What do we have left? Say it one more time. Okay, what equa what's the equation we had? Was it, we had one equation? We do we still have two? Okay, what was the equation? Times. M. Oh, oh, okay. And then all that times the impulse, not impulse, oh, inertia. Oh, moment of inertia, okay. And we already figured out a value for that, didn't we? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was something small. So we just need to solve this for t now, right? Okay. <clears throat> uh, so we want to combine like terms here, right? So how about we send this chunk upstairs and distribute that i in there? Okay. You'll see the two steps at once there. Send the denominator upstairs over here and distribute that i in here and here. So we'll do it in two steps, or in one step. So we'll have r radius of the shaft squared times mass times tension equals m times g times i minus tension times i. <coughs> Y'all see what I did? So I just took this, multiplied it here and here, and I took this, multiplied it there. And now we'll combine like terms. This piece has a T in it, and this piece has a T in it. So I'll add this chunk to the other side. So now I'll have radius of the shaft squared times mass times T plus T times I equals MGI. Now I can pull the T out of here. So I have T times radius of the shaft squared times m plus i equals m g i. Now we can just take that parentheses and send it downstairs. <coughs> so that t equals m times g times i over radius of the shaft squared times mass plus i. There we go. And uh, the problem gave us all these things here. So let's see, the mass was 0.123. Gravity is 9.81. I, we just wrote that down up there, 1.54 times 10 to the negative four. And then here, the radius of the shaft was really small. Was that 0.01? Yeah, 0.01. <coughs> no, 0.011. Y'all remind me, what was it? 1.1 centimeters, 0.011. Squared times the mass, 0.123. Plus that really small number, 1.54 times 10 negative 4. <coughs>
and that's tension, so we're talking about newtons. And uh, <coughs> to get to this equation here, we had to combine two equations. And one of those had to have A equals in it. What was that equation? It should be in your notes from yesterday. A equals? Negative T plus MG is over M. Okay, so now that we know T, we can just plug that in there. So acceleration will be negative 1.1 plus 0.123 times 9.81 divided by Mind your way, Clint. Sorry. What'd y'all get? Point eight seven. Okay. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> How fast would it go if we just dropped it? Nine point eight one, right? This is a lot less than nine point eight one. Is that what we expect? Y'all ever just dropped a yo-yo before? What does it do? It, it goes pretty slow. It accelerates, but it's much slower than if you just dropped it without the string attached, right? Okay, there we go. Y'all see <clears throat> how uh, this angular motion is tied to the linear motion? The yo-yo accelerates straight down, but that acceleration causes it to spin, so the two are, are linked together. Okay, well, let's do another problem here. Let me clear this off. The big giant key to these problems is just seeing what's rolling around what. Usually there's a rope wrapped around, a, a, a wrapped around something and then it's just, that's, it's just easy. It's just where the rope is wrapped around. Although sometimes they're rolling, in which case you, you look at where they're rolling on. Okay, so let's do another problem here. Let's do this one. So you've got this, I don't know what this is. I guess it's a crane that broke free. You cranked it up and then the, the crank broke and now it's just free falling. And uh, the disc has a mass of eight kilograms, so it's a pretty hefty disc. And then the mass on the end is half of it, four kilograms. The pulley at the top is ideal. What does that mean? Yeah, it's, it's massless and frictionless. Ah, but, so you have one real pulley here. In real life, they're both real. But that one's much smaller than this one. This one's the bulk of the issue, so we're gonna just deal with this one, okay? Uh, if the, if the system starts from rest, how many degrees has the disk turned in 15 seconds? Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is eight kilograms here. This is four kilograms here. Uh, we're given, the question is what's delta theta, time is 15 seconds. 
starts from rest, that means the initial velocity is zero. And they were kind enough to label the forces for us. Stole the job from you. Okay, so they've got forces labeled on here, and you need to uh, figure out how fast is this going to accelerate? What's the tension going to be? And really, we don't even care what the tension is. We just need to know what's the acceleration so we can find this. And it's, since it's asking for delta theta, it might actually be easier if we found angular acceleration to get to what we're asked for. OK, so um, let's see. Where do we start? We've already done the yo-yo problem. This one's very similar. How, how should we start this one? <clears throat> Newton's second law. We'll use Newton's second law for linear motion on the thing that goes in a straight line. But we'll use Newton's law for angular motion for the thing that spins. So let's do this one first. So we'll say sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. And, and this thing is going to accelerate. Which way is it going to accelerate? Down. So our forces are tension and minus uh, mass of the block times gravity equals negative mass of the block times acceleration. Why did I put a negative sign there? Because it's accelerating down. Don't, that's, that's the most missed negative sign. Don't forget that little guy. Okay. Well, we've got two unknowns, two equa or one equation, so we need another equation. So we'll go over here and deal with this thing now. We'll do the angular version of Newton's second law. I'll write it out right here. Some of the torques equals I alpha. It's the same equation. It's just the angular version. Torques are what causes things to spin. There's angular mass. There's angular acceleration. OK, so how many torques do we have on this? Just one. Do y'all see it? It's just that rope. That rope is going to cause it to spin because it's attached right here, and the radius is right here. So here's the tension. <clears throat> Notice this is the way it works every time. With ropes and pulleys, they're always perpendicular. It's just the way that it is. The, the radius is always perpendicular uh, to a rope wrapped around a pulley or a wheel rolling on the ground. They're always perpendicular. So remember the cross product, because remember torque <coughs> is R cross F. Do you remember that? Torque is R cross F, and the cross product gives you the perpendicular piece. And since this is perpendicular, we don't need to deal with the cross product. It's already the perpendicular pieces. Does that make sense? So cross product gives you the perpendicular pieces. These are already perpendicular, so we can just multiply these two and be done with it. Just good old fashioned regular multiplication. So we just need the radius of the disk times the tension, and that is this cross product which is the torque. Okay? How does, does that make sense to everybody? <clears throat> okay. Now this is going to cause the wheel to rotate that way. Is that positive or negative? Or, or let me try it the other way. So, I'm sorry, two right hand rules. Let me do the first one. Thumb is R. Fingers are force. Okay, so let me put my thumb in the direction of R. 
my fingers need to go in the direction of force. See, this way is the radius, that way is the force. So the answer is out of my palm, into the board. What does that mean? Out of the board is positive. So into the board is negative. So this is a negative torque. <coughs> this equals I. Now we need the moment of inertia. Now it told us what this thing is. Of course, you can look at the, t and at the picture and see. It's a disc. So this is when you pull out your equation sheet and look on your equation sheet and say, oh, I'll find a disk and find the equation for the moment of inertia. <coughs> yeah? Why is that radius negative? Well, it's not that the radius is negative, but the torque is negative. One half mr squared. Y'all see it on your on your table? It's one half mr squared. So this moment of inertia for a disc is just one half mr squared. And this will be the mass of the disc and the radius of the disc. And let me make that a lowercase r because it's the same as this one. And this has to be squared. Okay. So all this right here, all this right here, that's my i. That's my moment of inertia. All this is I. Now the question is, what's alpha? Well, that's the thing we don't know. Angular acceleration, we're trying to figure that out. This is our unknown that we want. If we can get alpha, and we know time, we can get to delta theta. That's what we're trying to get to. So we've got two equations with three unknowns. Let me underline them. We don't know tension. We don't know alpha, there's tension again, and we don't know A. Tension, angular acceleration, and linear acceleration, three unknowns, two equations. What are we gonna do? Any ideas? We'll pull that equation off the top of the equation sheet and we'll say A equals R alpha. This is true for things that are rolling down a road, things that are, have a rope wrapped around them like this and are gonna cause them to spin. <coughs> so I'm just gonna take this right here and I'm gonna put it in right there for A. So that this equation becomes tension minus mass of block times gravity equals minus mass of block times r times alpha. Now I've got two equations and two unknowns, and now we can solve it. Okay, how y'all doing? Any questions? The physics is done here. We'll finish the problem in a second. Do y'all understand concept-wise what's going on? Okay. Well, how do we solve this system of two equations? Yeah, solve for t in one of them, add it into the other one, get alpha, right? So <clears throat> how about we just take this piece here, add it to the other side. So we're gonna have tension is equal to mass of block times gravity minus mass of block times radius times alpha. So I just added this piece to the other side. We could, yeah, we can do that. Let's see, T is simplified a little bit. Mass of block times gravity minus R times alpha. Yep, good. That'll make life easier. And now we'll take this whole thing here and we'll insert it right 
there in T. Yes? That's okay. I make mistakes, so yell out if I do. Okay, so we'll insert that right here. So now let's write this out. Oh, wait, I forgot a piece. Ah, right here. Y'all got to yell at me when I make mistakes. Do y'all see the mistake I made? It was a big one. It's the most common one. And I, I keep telling y'all, don't forget this negative sign because I forget it all the time. Here it is, I forgot it. Do y'all see it? Which way is that disc going to spin? Which way is that? It's negative. How do I know it's negative? Here is the other right hand rule. Your fingers go this way. Where's your thumb point? Into the board. That's negative. Okay. Now, if you don't like that right hand rule, if you uh, just like memorizing things, <clears throat> clockwise is negative. Counterclockwise positive. That gets harder when you get to 3D stuff, but for 2D that works. Okay. So uh, I'm going to insert this equation over here, and I'm going to do a little bit of algebra. Very simple. Are you all ready? Negative and negative becomes positive. Now I'll insert that over here. So radius of disk times tension. Oh, I'm going to get rid of T. I'm going to insert that. Times the mass of the block times G minus radius times alpha equals mass of the disk times radius of the disk squared times alpha, the whole thing over two. Now, we're going to want to simplify this. We're going to want to combine like terms here. We've got an alpha here and an alpha there. So I'm going to take these two things and distribute it here and here. So I'm going to have <clears throat> radius of the disk times mass of the block times gravity minus, uh-oh, oh, we weren't careful. What radius is this? Is that the disk or, the, or something else? I guess that's the only thing we have, isn't it? Yeah, it's the only radius they gave us. So it's got to be the radius of the disk. It came from over here, radius of the disk. So A and R are related by, yep, radius of the disk. OK, that's right. <coughs> so we've got, so we multiply this times this. This is going to give us the radius of the disk squared times the mass of the block times alpha equals, on this side, we haven't changed anything over here, mass of the disk, radius of the disk squared times alpha divided by 2. Yeah? It's entirely possible. Uh, are you talking about this one? Yeah. Um, because both sides were negative, I made them both positive. Thank you for noticing, because I drop stuff like that. Okay, so now uh, let's take this whole thing here. Uh, we want to get alpha on the same side, so we're going to combine like terms. So let me take this, add it to the other side. Just this chunk, add it over there. Okay, so I'll write that. I'll keep going up here. <coughs> So on the left side, I'm going to have radius of the disk, the mass of the block, times gravity equals radius of the disk squared, mass of the block, times alpha, plus mass of the disk, radius of the disk squared, times alpha, uh, the whole thing over here, divided by 2. Y'all doing all right? We can pull this alpha out here. Do y'all see that? Pull the alpha out. So we're going to have alpha times radius of the disk squared. Hey, you know what? That radius of disk squared is in there twice. I'm going to pull that out with it. 
radius of the disk squared times mass of the block plus mass of the disk over 2. And this side is radius of the disk, mass of the block times gravity. We can simplify a little bit here. There's a radius of the disk and a radius of the disk squared. This is going to make that go away. And now we'll just take this whole chunk here, all this, send it downstairs over here, and that'll give us alpha. So alpha is equal to mass of the block times gravity divided by radius of the disk times mass of the block plus mass of the disk over 2. Okay. Well, those are just numbers. We can plug all that stuff in, right? Mass of the block, that was 4. Gravity is 9.81. Divided by radius of the disk, 30 centimeters, that's 0.3 times mass of the block, which is 4, plus mass of the disk over 2. Well, that's 8 divided by 2, so that's 4 also. There we go. <coughs> You'll punch that out. Let me know what you get. Sixteen point three five radians per second squared. Okay, so that's alpha. Now to answer our final question, how far does it spin in 15 seconds? How are we going to get there? <coughs> Any ideas? We know alpha now, no angular acceleration. I think equation number three on the angular side will do the job quite nicely. Let's see, where can I write that? I'm running out of board space here. Equation number three, delta theta equals omega naught times t plus one half alpha times t squared. What was the initial angular speed? Zero. zero. It started from rest. So this side is zero. So delta theta is equal to one half of alpha, which we had 16.35 times time, which was 15 squared. What's delta theta? Okay, there we go. How y'all doing? It's still 8 o'clock in the morning. It's not 8 o'clock, it's like 8.35 now. I mean, it's blood should be flowing well. Synapses are firing.
Oops, wrong button. I need that screen. All right, that's it. All right, so uh, the next section, we're still talking about rotational motion, but now we're going to talk about a specific application of rotational motion. It's one that has kind of become a standalone thing, planets. Not, but it's not just planets, it's, it's something orbiting around something else. So you see this in the nucleus of atoms too. You see it on the micro scale. Well, that's way smaller than micro. <clears throat> on the femto scale and on the uh, macro scale, I mean, on the huge galactic scale, you see this. So this, this sort of motion that Newton is talking about here happens all over the place. Now, <clears throat> here, it, let me, this is the equation. Newton figured this out, and I, it's called Newton's Law of Gravity, because Newton figured it out, although, to be fair, Kepler figured out most of it before Newton ever finished it. So Kepler had it almost done a good century before Newton came along. Newton took the equation and figured out just a little bit more, pushed it over the edge, and now we've got this equation that we call Newton's Law of Gravity. Now, <clears throat> here's, here's the thing. Let me, let me just kind of clarify this for you. Here's what this equation says, and this is what we know. How do we know? Well, we've measured it. Let me explain it. If you've got a mass like this chunk of coffee here, okay, and you've got another mass, this, this, uh, what is this? This is a, why is this on the table here anyway? It's been here forever. This multimeter. Okay, so you've got this multimeter and this coffee, and they're sitting here. That has mass and that has mass. That's what this says. If you've got two masses, and they're separated by a distance, the distance between them, then they will be attracted. That negative sign means they're pulled together. This is a reference to a coordinate system, uh, spherical coordinates where R points from the middle out, so negative R points in. So this one is attracted to that one, and this one is attracted to that one. So Newton's law of gravity is, let me just say this shorter, any two masses are attracted, period, end of story. That's all we know. Yeah. Well, that's, so in spherical coordinates, <clears throat> imagine a ball. It's, it's like Cartesian coordinates, but it goes from the middle to the edge, always out. So negative r hat means in. So imagine a ball where this is your center and, and this is the edge. So there's a ball around this. From the middle out would be that way. But that negative r hat means in. <clears throat> uh, if r gets bigger, what is r? distance between your two objects. If R gets bigger, what happens to the force of gravity? No. Nope. Look, see this one's downstairs? Because the, this is downstairs and this is upstairs, they're inverse of each other. So if this number gets bigger, this number gets smaller. Not just a little bit, this number's squared. Okay, so let me ask you this. When does the force of gravity stop working? How far away do you have to be? It doesn't ever stop. It just gets smaller and smaller. Does that make sense to everybody? So this, this law of gravity works on any two masses and every two masses. 
Okay, so Anthony has mass. Clint has mass. Newton says there's a force pulling these two guys together. Why don't they just like smack into each other because this force is pulling them together? Or these two right here? Why doesn't this slam into the coffee? Say it again. Did you say friction? That's exactly right. Perfect. Sorry, my ears don't work, and so I have to translate. Sorry. But yeah, exactly. The, this is pulled that way, but that's not the only force on it. There's another force here. Friction is opposing it. Remember, friction opposes all motion. And, and how much is the force pulling it this way? You see that G there? That's not 9.8. The number for this is the universal gravitational constant. Okay, what does universal mean? Everywhere. everywhere in the, where isn't this good? Oh yeah, it's good everywhere. <laughs> so long as you're in the universe, this constant's good. Which doesn't limit you. <laughs> okay, so what's that constant? Is that a big number or a little number? This is an itty bitty, I mean itty bitty number. So the force of gravity pulling this multimeter to that coffee is very, very, I'm not saying it's not there, I'm just saying it's so tiny that there's no way it can overcome friction. Do you all understand what I'm saying? Does this make sense? So now there is one that we can measure. You all ready for this? Here's a mass, okay? And we all happen to be standing upon another mass. That's kind of big. Oh yeah, that thing down there, we call it Earth. That's kind of big, isn't it? And let's see, is this mass attracted to that mass? Sure enough. <laughs> Does that make sense? So it's got to be big enough for you to measure it. Because this number is so small, one of these two or both of these two has got to be huge before you can finally have enough of it to measure. Does that make sense to everybody? So this is why the best place to measure this stuff is with planets. That's where Newton figured it out. He's, he, 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 Kepler had this idea, but the best way to measure it is with planets. So Newton got out telescopes and started measuring stuff. And So did he go to the telescope store to do that? That's what we do, right? That's not what he did. Why didn't he do that? There was no such thing as a telescope store. He had to make the thing himself. He had to go to the lens maker and say, hey, I need a glass lens this shape. And he had to figure out what that had to be and where the glass lenses had to be so that he could get a telescope. He had to understand how that worked. He invented that too. Well, Kepler and Galileo had played with that a long time before him, but he, he had to take their work modify it for what he wanted to do. And he actually modified it a whole new way. He came up with a slightly different telescope. That was even better. Anyway, <clears throat> here's what Newton's law doesn't say. Okay, let me just remind you. Here's what it does say. Here's what Newton's law of gravity does say. It says any two masses are attracted, period. That's the law. Okay? Here's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say why. Why are two masses attracted? Answer? I don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> I love that answer. It cracks me up. We've been trying to figure this out for centuries. Why are two masses attracted? I don't know. There's a bunch of good ideas out there. Some people say all those ideas are the same idea. They're not. Well, at least they don't seem to be. There's a whole bunch of ideas about why the... Let me, let me describe one of these. Um, <clears throat> and there, there's some researchers in, in, in Japan that really like this idea. And, and they've got... Uh, their idea is that any mass has a bunch of little invisible, unmeasurable, can't see them. This is worse than those bugs called noceums, right? You know, 
been bitten by noceums, right? You all know what I'm talking about? Who says, I know what a noceum is? <laughs> okay, just hang out outside a while. When you start getting bit, like, ow, what is that? And you can't see anything? That's because it's a noceum, bitch. You. There's a little bitty bug. Anyway, <clears throat> any mass, this is the idea. I'm not saying this is the answer. I'm just saying this is an idea. Any mass has a bunch of gravitons flying around it. Well, what's a graviton? Well, it's this thing. You can't, I don't know. We haven't found one yet. But there's these gravitons flying around, and, and Ashton's got gravitons because he's got, you know, a mass too. And, and everybody here, we all have these gravitons flying around us, and those gravitons, they interact with each other, and they, that's what pulls each other together. That's their idea. So, so they, they've got, uh, they found money. They talked to the Japanese government, and the Japanese government said, hey, that's a good idea. Why don't you measure some of those? And they said, okay, give us a couple billion dollars, and we'll try. And so they've dug this giant pit and put all these giant graviton sensors all over there and they've got to have this device to get down in there to measure, to fix all these sensors all the time and, and guess how many they've measured so far. <laughs> that doesn't mean they're wrong, it just means they haven't found them yet. Uh, another guy, um, he graduated from MIT with his PhD in physics and said, you know, I'm tired of all this math stuff. I'm going to go surfing. And so he went to Hawaii, moved, lived in Hawaii, and just went surfing for years. And just surfing, out, and got off his surfboard one day and said, ooh, dude, I got it. And he wrote out this paper, and he called it the theory of everything. That was quite a statement. <laughs> the, 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 and I think it was, had the word simple in it, too. I think it was like the simple theory of everything. And he, and he combined all the forces together and is mathematically it's beautiful. It's like this beautiful paper and everybody was all excited. The, the top physics journal in the world took it and it was their lead article and it was huge. Everybody was like, yes, he's got it figured out. And everybody was all excited and then a couple people started poking holes in it and it's back on the I don't know list. I'm just saying, why are two masses attracted? We don't know. Are they attracted? Yes. There you go. That's, that's how this works. <clears throat> how do we know they're attracted? Any ideas? We've measured it. We can measure it dropping objects on this planet. But we measure it looking at the moon going around the Earth. Or we can measure it looking at Jupiter going around the sun. You see what I'm saying? We've, we've measured it. Okay, well, <clears throat> I've got a minute and 15 seconds left, so we'll do this problem next time. We'll look at the gravitational pull of the moon, of the Earth on the moon, next time.